Now say it with me. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And I'm hoping you'll be saying that from, still continue to say it from time to time during the week as you get up, as you perhaps listen to the news, as you read the news or whatever. We need to be praising God and, and just thanking him for the day. I won't ask for a show of hands, but it's, it'd be almost impossible, I think, to live in today's society here in America, see what's changing, what's going, uh, happening, and not to be a little bit concerned, right? Uh, maybe even worried, maybe even fearful. Well, as Jeff said, uh, this last song we did was written by Martin Luther, and it was to a bar tune. You like those bar tunes? I'm not really up on my 16th century bar tunes, but apparently that was one of them. And last week, I think I mentioned uh, Charles Wesley did a lot of those too. He'd written over 5,000 songs, and many of those were to bar tunes. And the whole idea back then was to a tune that people would be familiar with, and probably a little bit of outreach. And apparently Martin was, you know, he'd been to a bar a couple of times. Um, but, but anyway, he wrote this, and Psalm 46 was really his inspiration for this song. And so we're going to look at Psalm 46 this morning. And there, I won't give you the whole history of Martin Luther. You can look it up and read about it and stuff. But it was not an easy time for him uh, personally, professionally, whatever. So he had to depend on God just for everything. And we're in a time where we need to depend on our Lord God as well in a, in a big way. Let me just pray again. Heavenly Father, as we open up your word now, I pray that your Holy Spirit will teach each of us something that we need to remember as we walk out the door to draw us closer to you in the way we live our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have, uh, you have your Bibles with you and you want to follow along, you might want to turn to Matthew chapter 24. Put a little piece of paper there if you've got a real Bible, like, you know, real Bible, like the one kind Jesus had. Just kidding, he didn't have this, okay? They didn't have the printing press didn't happen until 1440, I think. But anyway, and then go to Psalm 46. We'll come back to to Matthew 24 in a couple of minutes, but we'll start with Psalm 46 and some of the things that are in there. And I'll just try to kind of be quick. We have communion, which I'm looking forward to. It's always a special time with our church family. Psalm 46 starts off like this. The very top, before you get into the content, it says the following. To the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah, a song of Alamoth. And you kind of go, huh? Well, the only thing that's interesting to that is for those of us who are kind of into music, is, is a, we don't know who wrote the psalm, by the way. There's a lot of guessing. Um, people a lot of times think, as I've said before, well, David wrote all the psalms. No, he didn't. He wrote more than anyone else, but he didn't write all of them. Moses wrote Psalm 90, for example. You know, Moses, really? Was he still around? No, but they took it from a long time before that. But So we don't know who wrote this, but it says a song of Alamoth. And Alamoth apparently was, were the girls, the soprano singers, Okay. So this is meant for a high voice. Now keep in mind, all of the psalms, all 150 of the psalms, were originally songs to be sung. Unfortunately, we don't have the music, but here it's really clear that it was designed for uh, soprano singers. And um, our daughter, a long time ago, was at Christian College, and they had a group called the Bel Canto Singers. And the Bel Canto were just gals. They must have had 50, 60 gals. And there was amazing music they put together. So this is designed for that. Doesn't mean that if you're a guy... You can't read Psalm 46, but please don't sing it, okay? That's uh, Anyway, uh, Psalm 46 is, God, we're learning about that God is our assurance in times of uncertainty and chaos. Okay, we'll ask you to raise your hands. How many of you feel like we're living in a time of uncertainty and chaos? That looks like about 100%. And if you didn't raise your hand, we need to find out if you're still got a heartbeat. But... Um, <laughs> This is a tough time. It's a strange time. And so I thought this psalm would be for us. Point number one, our God is infinitely strong and present. Now, many of the psalms, when you read them, they start off with, oh, I've got this problem. Woe is me. Help me, God. But in this psalm, we start off, God starts off big and bold, big and bold. It starts off with verse number one says this, God is our refuge and strength. Wow, our refuge and strength. How many of you have ever been camping perhaps, and the thunderstorm happened and you had to get out of your tent and find something that was a little more, better shelter. Some of you done that? Okay, good. I remember in Boy Scouts, we were like that one time. We had our two men pup tents and it started raining like crazy and we didn't have floors and those things, just the dirt. And the water started coming in and stuff and our scout leader said, okay, break camp, we're leaving, we're going home. You know, it didn't really work. Um, so we, uh, we gave into that. 
God is our refuge and strength. So refuge is a place of protection, a place where you could go and get in out of the rain, so to speak, if that's really important to you. It'd be kind of like mom and, you know, kind of like mom and dad being a refuge for a kid who has a bad dream at night. You know, it's like, I got a bad dream. I got to go and be with mom and dad. They're my refuge. So it says, God is our refuge and strength. I won't ask, but I know that all of us, all of us needs strength. We need to like keep going. You know, there are times you get tired and you get tired of just everything. It continues on in that verse. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help. In other words, he's not distant. He's not somewhere else. He's very present. God is here now. God is here now. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Now, a little seminary thing here for you. I've mentioned it before, but most of you forgot. Therefore, whenever you see the word therefore, you should see what it's there for. See, I did all kinds of seminary. Went to, you know, spent years and years to learn that. Okay, I learned that. And what it, what it means is you should reread what was just said because that's what it's there for. And the therefore is, uh, again, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, because of all of that, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Try to picture that. The earth be removed. How many of you have lived through a significant earthquake? Did you feel like, I feel the earth move? Sorry. Um, <laughs> I wasn't going to do that, but what the heck. <laughs> but it's like, I mean, you know, you just try to imagine what the psalmist was trying to say here, what he was getting at. He was trying to, he was trying to demonstrate how, how big things get sometimes, and when the earth is quaking or whatever, you can't stop it. I mean, it's just going on. So, therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, could be earthquakes, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Verse 3 says, Though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Those are a bunch of negative things. Now, uh, most of you have gone to church long enough to have had probably 25 different explanations of the word Selah. But in case you haven't, because we have some newer Christians here and some th people who are just, you know, still trying to figure it out. And those of you online, high online people. But the word Selah is really kind of a musical term. Remember I said these were meant to be sung. And so a musical term here would be like a rest, like pause. And I think the practical thing for those of us who are reading the Bible is when you see the word Selah, we ought to ponder what we just read instead of rushing on to the next verse or whatever. So ponder, think about it. Let these words sink in. That's what the Selah thing means to me. We go on to verse four. There is a river and he's painting, now the psalmist is painting a picture of a healthy city, of the city of God, Jerusalem, for example. A, so he says, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. Now, back in these days, um, one of the things that you needed in order to have a healthy city, you need to have water. I mean, it's essential. We all have to have water. We take it for granted. We turn on the water, we turn off the water. I have a friend of mine who runs a ministry, and they build water wells in Malawi, which is a little uh, landlocked country in Africa. And they built, I think, a hundred and some odd water wells over the last 15 years. These people are like, oh, it's so great to have, be able to get water. Most of us, we don't think about that. We just turn the spigot and out comes the water. And here, the psalmist is painting this picture. He says, again, there is a river whose stream shall make glad, glad, happy, the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle, the most high. Those, it's kind of like, you know, we're in God's city here. There's plenty of water, which for them back then would have been like, oh, that's amazing. It's a great picture. There's a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. We're talking about God. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved or shaken or upset. Um, now, stuff happens, doesn't it? I mean, we've been hearing about the hurricane down in, in Florida and up, up north of there and stuff. Stuff just happens. But those of us who are in Christ need not feel like, oh, my life is over. Everything's coming to an end. No, we should be able to be firm in the midst of it. Doesn't mean we have we we avoid stuff. Sometimes people come to Christ, and they and they get really upset within the first year because some bad stuff happens. I thought that if I came to Jesus, all the bad stuff would stop happening. 
How many of you ever heard anybody, not you, how many of you ever heard anybody say that or act that way? Yeah. There's about 10 of us who are honest. Okay. So the fact of the matter is stuff still happens. But now we have a resource. We can go to Almighty God for his wisdom. Do I turn to the left? Do I turn to the right? Do I go straight? What do you want me to do, Lord? I think that's, so God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. Moving on. God shall help her, talking about the city, just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. We're talking about the power of God here. He uttered his voice. The Lord of hosts. Yahweh. We talked about that some time ago. Yahweh can control it all. He has all power. And that's the picture that the psalmist is trying to get us to see. Despite the fact that all this stuff might be happening, God is more powerful than all the stuff. God has power over this stuff. We'll talk more about that. And then we have that word Selah again. So again, Selah, pause. Think about it. Ponder. Ponder. I like that word ponder because, again, even Mary said that uh, when she, when all the, you know, all the angels came and talked to her and all this kind of stuff. And Mary pondered those things in her heart it talks about. She'd go, wow, what just happened? You know? And I like that word because we, and I'll talk more about this before the message is over. Uh, good Lord willing and the crick don't rise. Um, we don't ponder enough in my opinion. We Christians just don't. We're racing. We're going to this. We're going to that. Um, and here, I like the word Selah. It reminds us of that. So this first point is all about our God is infinitely strong and present. Next, our God sees everything and knows the past and the future. You know what you did last week that was a mess up? God saw that. Now, I'm not trying to pick on anybody. Oh, there's a couple of people up here in the front I could pick on, but you know, I'm not going to do that. But our God sees everything. Uh, earlier this year, we did a, a study of a bunch of the names of God. Because sometimes people, especially if they're new in the faith, they think, well, he's Lord, he's God, Jesus, um, I think Almighty. You know, we think of different things like that. But we talked about some of the Hebrew words that are also indicative of who God is. And one of them that I wanted to remind you of is El Roy. El Roy. Two words. And basically, it is the God who sees me. And I got to share this with you because I, my, I understand that, you know, I mean, I kind of know our people. And I know that there are many of you who are solo right now. And there are probably times, even if you're not by yourself, there are probably times when you kind of wonder, does God know what's going on? Does he care? You know, I prayed and I don't feel him necessarily. And we feel, and I think the enemy of our faith tries to teach us don't spend time with God. He's got some important things to take care of. Don't bring this little Mickey Mouse thing up to him. He's God. Here's the deal. El Roy, he sees you. He sees you when you wake up. He sees you when you go to bed. He sees you 24-7. He knows what's going on with you. And we get this word out of uh, Genesis chapter 16 with Hagar, and I'm not going to re-preach that or reteach that. But El Roy is an important thing for you and I to realize that God sees us. He sees you right where you are. He sees you when you fail in your walk with Christ. He sees you when you come back to him. And it's not that you've lost your salvation, but it's, again, he sees all of that. And he sees when you're lonely, and he sees when you're hurting, and he sees when someone says something about you or to you that hurts your feelings and, and whatever it might be, God sees all of that. And I just want you to kind of remember that. He's a God who sees. Now I want you to go to Matthew 24, if you have your Bibles and your, your, have a little place marker there. And I want to look at Matthew chapter 24, because again, I'm not going to teach through all of this. I'm going to hit some of the highlights. There's a lot in this. I could spend a couple of Sundays at least just talking about Matthew 24. And again, the title of this section of my message this morning is, Our God Sees Everything and Knows the Past and the Future. So Matthew 24, first verse, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. What was Jesus doing in the temple? Well, Jesus went to the temple often, and he went there to teach. He was a teacher. He was always there, and he always got a crowd. You know, he, had, he probably had his 12. They were there, but there was a bigger crowd. They wanted to come. What, is this, what does this rabbi have to say? Rabbi means teacher. And they would listen to Jesus. And so here it says, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples, that's the 12, his disciples came up uh, to show him the building of the temple. The temple's built, being built, being enhanced like it always was, it seems like, always under construction. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another 
that shall not be thrown down. Huh? Now, what they didn't realize, but what we realize now in hindsight, is that the, and this has happened, Jesus said this probably about 30 A.D.-ish, okay? And what happened at 70 A.D. is that the temple was destroyed. Jesus was prophetically saying the temple is going to be destroyed. Again, he said, you know, again, I will say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon the other that shall not be thrown down. Now, for the guys, they're kind of going, temple looks in good shape. We just got through in there worshiping. You just got through teaching. He was, he was talking about the future. And Matthew 24 is about the future. A lot of powerful stuff. Like I said, I don't have time to teach through the whole thing this morning. Now, as he sat, he, Jesus, sat on the, the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? This is where it gets really interesting because even then, the disciples in the first century were waiting for, expecting the end of time to happen, the end of the age to happen. And that was 2,000 years ago. And so it's like, and I, I've been thinking, I kind of pondered this myself. I did it my own Selah, and I was pondering, and I'm kind of going, so what's the deal here, Lord? I mean, help me to see this. And part of what I saw as I pondered this is probably in every generation, there have been groups of Jesus followers who have said, this is the time he's got to be coming back because of the following things that are going on. Things are so crummy, you know, that he's got to be coming back now. And I think one of the things that does for us Jesus followers is it helps us keep our eye on him. And we're talking about the rapture, and we're talking about the tribulation and the second coming, which is a whole bunch of revelation stuff. But Matthew 24 gives us a little bit of a hint of some of these things, because Jesus was talking about that at the end of the age. For us today, I would say this is, we're talking about, Jesus was prophesying about the end of the church age. And I don't want to get into that too much, except to say that when Jesus was walking on the face of the earth, there was no church. The church didn't start happening until the book of Acts. And so before that, Old Testament, there's no church. And in the New Testament, at least the Gospels, there's no church. But then starting in the book of Acts, the church age starts. So they're asking him, when will be the end of the age? When are we going to get out of this, this two-bit town? When are you going to take us up? Because he had been talking, Jesus had been talking and teaching about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God and, uh, in heaven and hell. And so they just asked him the question. And Jesus said this in verse 4. And Jesus answered them and said, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not led astray, that is, deceived. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And for you, for us, those of us who are Jesus followers, we're kind of going, others will come in the name of Christ. There's only one Christ, and you're right, there's only one real Christ. But there's a bunch of fake Christs out there. Remember Jim Jones? Sun Myung Moon, remember those guys? They claim to be the Messiah. And there's, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who have claimed to be the Messiah. I read about one guy, true, who claimed to be the Messiah, had some followers, and had his wife literally crucify him. That guy needed mental help. But it's like Christ's, you know, Messiahs, there are people who, and again, what's happening is the enemy of our faith, Satan, is trying to deceive the followers. He's trying to tell, well, the, He's not the only Christ. I can, we can have our own, we can make our own Christ. Sorry, I gave you that picture in your mind. Now you'll be thinking about it the whole time. And if you ever get to the point where you want to do that with your husband, please talk to me, okay? We need some real help here. <laughs> but, it, but then Jesus said, for all these things must come to pass, and yet the end is not here. And again, keep in mind verse 5. It says, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Is that not happening? Has that not happened basically our whole lives, it seems like? There are wars and rumors of wars. Okay, like I said, there's a lot of deep stuff I could teach on here. Don't have the time to get into it really in depth. Um, he says, 2 Timothy 3.13, But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Then back to Matthew 24. For nations will rise up against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Catch this from Jesus' mouth. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Now, I am thankful that I am not a woman. And most of us guys would probably never make it through childbirth if we had to do that. Uh, I heard one time a guy say, you know what childbirth is like, you, you guys? Get your upper lip, pull it over your head. That's kind of childbirth. <laughs> Sorry. 
But all these things must happen before the second coming. All these things are merely birth pangs. And again, birth pangs are those you know, contractions. And it's not that the, we're having a bunch of them, but your doctor would say on the phone, said, well, how, how intense are they and how far apart are they to know whether or not it's really time for the, the baby to be born? Verse 23 of Matthew 24 here says, Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or he is over here, do not believe him, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and will provide great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect, that's the Christians, even lead Christians aside, astray. Behold, Jesus says, Behold, I've told you in advance. Out of uh, 2 Peter 1.16 we read, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And here's a key verse for you. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 says this, But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture becomes a matter of someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. That's powerful. That's why we believe all Scripture is inspired by God. 2 Timothy 3. So, Jesus is telling his disciples and us too to not be shaken by these things. Okay, so we need to be firm in our faith. And Matthew 24 has got a lot of good things to say. Luke 21, 28 says, When these things come to pass, lift up your head, for redemption draws nigh. Uh, Maranatha is a word we use a lot. Uh, for those of us who are into Revelation, it comes from 2 Corinthians, where it says, again, Maranatha, again, come quickly, Lord Jesus. It's an Aramaic word. And back then, they used that, because they all spoke Greek back in the New Testament days, but they used the Aramaic word to kind of like a little, a little sign like Maranatha. And if the other person looked at him stupid, then he said, well, he's not a believer. Okay? Kind of like the ichthus fish that they had back in the day too, which is another story. Back to Psalm 46. Um, I'm only on verse about 2 in Psalm 46. We'll be out of here about 1 o'clock. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. I read that to you before, but that's the kind of, we should be comforting by all this. We should be comforted by the birth pangs which are happening. What we're seeing in this country and what we're seeing in the world are birth pangs. We're getting close to the delivery time. Would it, could it be today? It could be today. We could all get raptured out of here today. Might it be after we have come and gone on this planet? It might be. Only the Father knows for sure when the time is and when he's going to pull the trigger on that. Matthew 24. It's really important for you to take a look at that. But i got to continue on, though, in Psalm 23. Let me go down to verse 2 and 3. Therefore, we will not fear. I'm repeating this again. Even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and are troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. In other words, we as Christians need not fear. And this was, not, this was even done before the time of Christ. This was done in the, in the Psalms. 1 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. I preached on that before. It's a great verse for you to have circled in your, in your Bible somewhere. Turn to it when you get fearful. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. I could do a whole teaching on that, but I'll just give you the verse for right now. Um, God does not want his children to be fearful. Doesn't mean we're not, it doesn't mean we're going to be happy with all the stuff we're going through, but we need not be fearful. Verse 6 of Psalm 46 says, The nations made an uproar, the kingdom tottered. He raised his voice, the earth quaked, the Lord's armies are with us. Wow, I love it. Keep in mind, our Heavenly Father is in control. So, point so far is our God is infinitely strong and present, and our God sees everything and knows the past from the future. Last point, our God will be exalted. Psalm 46, verses 8 to 10. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He made war, catch this, he makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two, burns the chariot of fire. God can enforce his rule. When he's ready, he can just go and it's over. Now a verse I hope that you will circle in your Bibles. It's one of my favorite verses. Psalm 46, 10. Be still and know that I'm God. I've quoted that verse many times in here. And I really feel like in 21st century world in which we live, we really need to remind ourselves of this. Because everything we have, it seems like, is drawing our attention to it. The 24-7, how many of you, okay, let's just see how old we are. How many of you remember on the TV stations a long time ago when they went off the air at the end of the evening? Okay, yeah, okay. Nowadays, if you're under, if you're under the age of 60, you kind of go, they went off? <laughs> 
was that was that a power failure or what was it? <laughs> no, they were just done. It was like 12 o'clock at night. It's like, okay, and you had this little circle on there and stuff like that. So there's now we have 24-7 news cycle, you know, and I Debbie and I talk about the weather from time to time too, because now you can go online and you can get it down to the hour. We know it's supposed to be hot today, blah, blah, blah. When I was growing up, weather was on the front page of our family newspaper and it was like a one inch square. There's the weather, we think. Okay, and now we get it by the minute, pretty much. It's just amazing. But we need to learn to be still and know that I'm God, which means we need to find, and again, in context with Psalm 46, it means we need to, again, Psalm 46 is talking about all the, the, you know, the water's rushing and all this kind of stuff. We need to find a way to shut everything down and be still. Turn off the phone, turn off the TV, turn off the music, turn off whatever, and just be still. It's, it's almost something we have to practice because we're in such a, we're not, we don't know how to do that anymore. And teenagers today, and we have some here with us today, but teenagers have a tougher time because they've never known a time without the internet. They've never known a time when there was a lot of, when there was quiet. I mean, it's hard to find, you know, it's just, I mean, and I've got some teenage grandkids and stuff, and they're all going through the same kind of thing. But we need to practice, be still, and know that I'm God. And he goes on and says, I will be, God is talking here. Now, up until this point, we're talking about all this kind of stuff, and then God comes up big and bold right here. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Wow. And then verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Now, this is the end of Psalm 46, but I think it continues into Psalm 47. So I'm going to give you just a couple of verses out of there as well in Psalm 47. So we're, we're pausing. We're pausing Selah at the end of this thing. We're thinking about, be still and know that I'm God. And I would encourage you, because you'll forget by tomorrow what I've said today. I'm, I would encourage you to find some time today to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take five minutes, 15 minutes, whatever you can find, and I'm going to practice this. Practicing the presence of God. Practicing the presence of Him and being still and knowing that He is God. And say, okay, Lord, I'm turning everything off, and I'm just going to wait on you. Read a Bible verse if you want to, something from today or some favorite verse of yours, and say, Lord, here I am, and then shut up. But Lord, I've got this big list. Shut up and just say, Lord, here I am. What do you want me to think? And I will bet if you'll spend five, ten minutes of just in silence, I'll bet you that something will impress your spirit. Some of you will say to me, well, Pastor, God ever, never speaks to me. How do you know? You're not quiet enough to hear him. He speaks in a whisper. He speaks through his Holy Spirit who is alive within us. He wants to, he wants to lead us. He wants to guide. You're one of his children if you've been born again. He wants to have a conversation with you. But all we do is we typically like, blah, 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 blah. Lord, I need this, this, this. Here's my list of all the things. And then out the door we go. And he goes, I have some things I'd like to say to you that would be comforting, that'd be encouraging. But we never spend the time to do that. I'm encouraging you to do that. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. So we get into Psalm, we go right now into Psalm 47, which says this. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. So, I'm not going to go through all of Psalm 47, but again, it continues on. We're to, we're to clap our hands. We're to, we're to thank God in advance, if you would. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith does not see. Faith believes God. If you could see it, you wouldn't need faith. And I, I look at our relationship with God, and I look at we should walk by faith, and I think a lot of Christians struggle with that. I don't know how to walk by faith. That's okay. That's why you come to church. That's why we have the Bible. This, this, this book is really, this book is amazing. It really is. Oh, i got to say this, too. You know, all the stuff we're going through today in our country and in the world, it's all happened before. It's all happened before. You read through this thing, and you read through all the Old Testament stuff, and you get into, like, judges, and the day they were... No kings, and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Does that sound like today? I think this is right. I think I'm a, I don't want to get into gender stuff, but you get the idea. Anyway, this all happened before. Yes, technology has changed. They didn't have, you know, atomic power back in, back in the day. The Old Testament was written. But the, the people-to-people -people thing is, is the same kind of stuff. And God has answers for all of that. He's got something to say about all of that. 
Hebrews 11, 1 again, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In Acts chapter 16, as a verse I used last week or the week before, Paul and Silas had been arrested. They were in jail and they were expecting God to do something. God, you know, we're here. You can let us go free. You can take us to be with you, whatever. And they were singing at midnight. If you were in jail and you were wondering whether or not you're going to live or not, would you be singing to God at midnight? I don't know. Most people probably wouldn't, but they were. And God then rescued them out of there. We talked about that a little bit last week. But there are spiritual battles going on all the time. And I was kind of wondering, you know, why? Why are there spiritual battles going on all the time? We talk about the enemy of our faith who is Satan. And it's basically, I thought about this, and I, I came up with kind of, a, kind of a semi-answer. It's because once upon a time, Satan was our captain of our lives. And then we left his team and joined Team Jesus. And he's mad. He lost us to the, to the Lord God Almighty. That's why we continue to have hassles from him. Even as believers, Satan wants to continue to hassle us and, and lead us astray. But remember this from 1 John, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That's an important verse for us to hold on to. Psalm 47, 1 to 4 says this, Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is awesome. He is a great king over the earth, over all the earth. He will subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He will choose our inheritance for us, the excellent of Jacob, whom he loves, Selah. So the key, one of the keys is for us to worship God before the storm, during the storm, after the storm. We sang A Mighty Fortress. That was the one that when Martin Luther was with his peeps and things were getting tough, he would say to them, let's sing Psalm 46. And I don't know if some of those words that they were singing then came out into his bar tune version of that or not. But here's a summary. Well, I don't know if it's a summary. I'll just tell you about a, a bridge to hide under. I'll give you the story really quickly. Once upon a time, Debbie and I took a trip. We had a friend's car. It was a Datsun 2000 ragtop. Some of you kind of go, Datsun? Yeah, that was pre-Nissan. And we drove from where we were living in Manhattan Beach to the guy who owned it. He was in the uh, Air Force, and he was in Texas. And um, we drove, it was a ragtop, and it was a five-speed, two-seater, it was, a, it zipped. So I'm zipping along. We're doing Highway 10 all the way down to, and probably about New Mexico, we hit a mother of all storms. At least I felt like it. Big hail, ragtop, big hail. Get the picture? I'm going, oh my gosh. And I know Debbie probably hasn't thought of this until I just mentioned it just now. But we were, we, we were driving along, and we needed, a, we needed a refuge. We needed a place to hide. And up ahead, there was a, a bridge. We raced there. We weren't the only ones who raced there, and we stopped. And we got underneath the ridge, and we were safe until the, everything let up. And then we took, up, took on. Um, some of you need that bridge. I can sing the bridge over troubled water right now, and that's just a fun song. But it's, it's really, some of you are looking for that bridge. You guys are in tough, tough waters, and you need that bridge. And God is our refuge and strength, a present help in times of trouble. That's what it says in Psalm 46. Let him be your bridge. Look to him. Look to him. It says, what though the mountains fall into the sea and the earth be done away, yet I will not fear. For God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind, 1 Timothy 1.7. And then finally, be still and know that I'm God. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the practical word of God, which is a lamp unto our feet and light into our path. Thank you for your presence with us. May we all take something from today's service that will keep us close to you. In the name of Jesus, amen.